What's up, baddies? Welcome to Bad Therapy. Tonight, we're starting the podcast by taking a motherfucking shot for Madison's motherfucking, motherfucking birthday. birthday. So if you have anything to drink with us, take, take a, a shot. shot. It's my birthday. I'll get drunk if I want to. Can't deny that I want to because I always fucking want to. Uh, it's funny because I had to like convince her to take this shot with us. With us. With me. Because it's a Tuesday, brother. Yeah, but it's your birthday, brother. So it's episode 35. And I don't know if anyone that watches the video pod can tell, but the scenery is scenerying. The set is setting. The set is setting. I was going to say the set is setting and you said the scenery is scenerying. Like, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. We got there. We finally figured it out. Like, how good well, does first it look? Well, first of all, I got a couch. Second of all, Madison hated the TV blank. She hated the TV. I was like, what the fuck do you want me to do? TV is literally attached to the, the wall. The big black TV in the back of our last bed. I, I was like. <laughs> but I agree. It looks. We put a little fire. We have my other little fire. My actual fire. And I got a couch. Guys, I got a couch. My first ever couch. She's an adult. I'm adulting. Episode 35. Episode 27. On Year Madison. <laughs> year Madison. Year Madison. Episode 27 on Year Madison. It's Year Madison. Basically, this is the year. <laughs> Well, technically, it's not my birthday yet. It's my birthday at midnight, and it's 10, 15 right now. Okay, by the time you see this, it will have been three days past. So on that note, cheers to your birthday and episode 35. Tink. Tink. Because <laughs> they're, pla <laughs> they're plastic glasses. They don't make any noise. So I'm turning 27. They say that when you're 27 is when you grow into your like 27 adult face. Like that's your new face basically. Mm -hmm. I'm terrified because I didn't believe this. I didn't think this was a thing. And Allie literally just told me. Well, cause I saw something on TikTok where some guy was saying, you know, who made the adulting age 18? Because I'll be damned if any 18 year old out there has anything to do with adulthood. Like in any way, shape or form. You don't reach adulthood until you're in your later twenties. And I saw some guy say 27 is the actual age that you start to feel like, damn, I'm an adult. And he was like, the reason being is because you actually look in the mirror and you have an adult face. Like for whatever reason, 27, you get your adult face. What? So I saw Madison today and I was like, okay, so it's your 27th birthday. Do you have your 27 adult face yet? And she looked at me and she was like, I could not believe my face like looked weird. I woke up, my like my eyes were further apart. <laughs> my nose was like a little bigger. No, my was. forehead was extra shiny. <laughs> I looked old and crusty and dusted and musted. I'm fucking pissed. All right. Well, I think you look the same, but I don't know if that's like an insult or a compliment. She was like, do you have your 27 year old face? And I like pulled down the visor in the car and I looked in the mirror and I was like, she literally said, I do. Oh my God. She's like, is that why I look so ugly today? Just like weird. But you like, know? it's so, but it's so funny because you see the aging process that happens throughout life. And you're like, at what point does it change? Because I think about like what my mom looked like when she was in her twenties totally. versus what she looks like now. Like they could be two completely different people. Doesn't even look like the same person no not like there's like a bad difference you know what i'm saying like i honestly feel like my mom aged really well but it's just funny to think what will we look like or even me when i look back at my 16, 16? 17 year old face i look nothing like that girl i showed my fiance a picture of me on my 21st birthday and he was like madison you look like you're 16 yeah that doesn't even look like yeah. you why were you at a bar you yeah. shouldn't have been allowed to drink like, i was 21 no i was literally a whole ass adult i went through like this weird phase actually when i was i think 20 21 20 22, where I felt so ugly because I felt like I didn't look like myself. And I think that was when it really started to like shift the facial structure or whatever the fuck it was. But I just did not, no matter what I tried, I remember feeling like I did not look like myself. Like one day I felt like myself and I felt young and beautiful. And then one day I just felt like this fat, ugly ogre. And I hadn't even like Jeez. really changed that much. And I was like, what is changing? And looking back, I'm thinking probably because I was just aging. And that's just like the aging process. I just hadn't really grown into myself yet. It's like the second growth spurt that you go through like, like growing into your face it was awkward it was like this awkward phase where i felt like i didn't look like myself i didn't know how to like wear my new face i don't know if it was more just in my head or if it was like really what i looked like but i just remember being like super insecure and i feel like i finally feel like myself again for like, sure into my new self getting into your late 20s like when everything kind of grows together yeah. oh by the way i cut my fucking hair <laughs> we can tell it looks cute I didn't even mention it. yeah so i'm i'm looking like my 27 year old self it's giving chic lord farquaad <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, so Madison, the first time I ever cut my hair. And let me just tell you. This, this makes me sound such, like this, such a bitch. But this is true friendship because for a friend to look you dead in the eyes <laughs> right after you chopped all your hair off and tell you. No, not just tell you. She recorded a video of me. This is making me sound like such a bitch. <laughs> well. If the shoe fucking fits, <laughs> posted it on Finsta with the caption, or no, with me fucking <laughs> cropped next to a picture of Lord Farquaad. A side by side. Yeah. In my defense, it I wasn't mean, it like, was a, it wasn't like a picture of her looking like no. cute, like just styled her hair. It was like she just rolled out of bed and it was like the bottom was very like coiffed. And like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the worst picture of me I've ever seen in my life. I had like mascara like drooped under my eyes, like a double chin. I'm like making this dot. Du- yeah, this makes you sound worse, by the way. Like a guy, sound like a terrible friend. No, but that's what I'm saying. Like, true friendship is when we both found that funny. But quite obviously, this haircut is very flattering, very suiting for your face shape, and especially for the new face that you've grown into. So, like, it's <laughs> sexy, Lord Farquaad. You know, I, I always had, like, a, an issue with wanting to cut my hair because I feel like everyone gets old and they just cut their hair. Oh, everyone and does it's the like, chop. It's like the old person haircut. And every person that I've seen since I cut my hair is like, you look so much older. And I'm like, mm. Is that a compliment? Like, more like, mature. And I'm like, mm. I'm like I don't know. I literally like, said that to her tonight. I was like, you don't look older. You no, look more mature. And it's not like an insult. Like I agree, it is. But I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Like mature lifestyle haircut. yet. Every girl goes through a chop, yeah. like at one point or another. I just did it like a year ago. I regretted it. The worst regrets of my life. We want to talk about Lord fucking Farquad. I cut mine right under my chin. Like mm. don't do it. Do not do that. <laughs> like give yourself some. Unless you like want to do it. Like I almost feel like I wish I went a little shorter. I'm glad that I didn't because I do like the length. But I do feel like I like the length so much that once it starts it's gonna grow fast and then i'm gonna be like damn now I it's long sh- again. cut it again yeah. because it's to me this is short that's medium but it's definitely sure. not short it's borderline long i feel like you look really cute i don't know i don't think i i really like, don't with like a lob i really don't think oh my so. god i don't think i have the face shape for a lob that would give lord far but <laughs> i've considered it like i'll see how i feel about the short hair long term and then if i want to go a little shorter like it's just hair it'll grow back but enough about my fucking hair because that's boring i, I just felt like i had to like, had to, like get into point it. it out yeah long story short for this opening is don't be afraid of aging my girlies because it just no. means you're alive yeah and honestly like as i get older if there are any like early 20s or even teens listening to this podcast and anyone older can definitely relate to this life gets harder in different ways as you get older but it gets so much easier in so other much ways better yeah. you care less about what people think you care less about what you look like things that don't matter you really start to grow into yourself what matters to you you meet the people that are meant to be in your life and you care less about the people that are not like I remember being in my early 20s and you know even in high school and early college and feeling like lost confused like I didn't fit in anywhere lonely lonely isolated misunderstood misunderstood (laughs) I'm just repeating everything you say (laughs) but when you I don't know like a switch just flips one day and I don't even think I'm fully there yet like I'm 26 well I'm a 25 I turned 26 in October but I feel like 25, 24, 25 for me was like the age where I started to really just feel comfortable with myself. And I've heard that it even gets better as you get older. So if there's one thing, I know like no one wants to age physically, right? Because I've heard that like as you get older, you always feel like your 20 year old self, but then you look in the mirror and you're 85. 50 and you're like, what happened? So I could see that being challenging, but I think that the thing we all have to remember as young people aging is as life goes on, you kind of come to terms with these things as they're happening and they're not as scary as they may seem and I think it's honestly kind of beautiful because again the physical superficial shit really only matters when you're in your 20s when you're 20 years old and you care less as you get older not to say you don't care what you look like you still take care of yourself but I also just think like there's so much responsibility that comes with being older but there's also so much freedom yeah right like yeah when you're in your young 20s you're broke Mm -hmm. you're confused heartbroken don't know know where you're going in life career wise totally you don't have like a set path for yourself you don't really see yourself as an independent yet because you're still, like we said earlier, 18 is not an adult. You're fresh out of the fucking womb. If adulthood starts at 18 and you're 21, you're three years old. You're a three-year-old adult. Literally. So cut yourself some slack for like how you feel at that time because my most tremendous growth period really was from like 23 to 26. Mm. The person I was when I was 23, Mm. that was an 18-year-old. That was a 21-year-old. Like That was a baby, a child. Yeah, I still, my thought process.
process, the way that I handled emotions, the way that I handled work. I would say even me, like 24 was when it really shifted. And then this whole year, I'm, I'm almost a full year into being 25 years around the sun. And I feel like I'm just finally getting like a grasp on life, finances, career, time management, friendship, relationships, my mental health, my emotional intelligence within myself and how I treat people and talk to myself. And it's just so funny because you, I feel like even if you were a young person listening to this right now and you're just gonna hear it, it's gonna go in one ear and out the other because I remember hearing this shit and you're nothing like, really clicked until it actually clicked. You're like, fuck you old people. But <laughs> I'm like, well, really? Because I wanna be dead. Life sucks. I'm broke. Every guy I date is a piece of shit. I don't know where I'm going. You know, like it's, it's the end of the world when you're 22 years old, but it gets better. Just to finish this thought out, and I wouldn't know this yet, as I've gotten older, have gotten to experience relationships with people in their 30s, and they say that being in your 30s is basically as fun as being in your 20s, but like with money and like emotional intelligence. Yeah. So you get to have, I mean, people are scared of getting older because like, I don't get to go out. I don't get to party. I don't get to have. No, you don't have to go out because you have a house to party at. No, and you literally <laughs> have money. Yeah. Which you go on money, vacation to party. Money isn't everything, but money is a lot for well, sure. It's a huge stressor in everyone's life, especially a young person trying to survive. Like, which, which is why I'm so glad. And this is no shame to people who had kids young because I, I see the other side of that too. Like I see like, let me get it over with and enjoy my 40s. Yeah, and then be able to be around for your child's life. I'm so glad that I'm not gonna have kids until like my mid 30s because I really want to experience this like independence, financial independence. It's like the best of both worlds. Like if you have, if you get knocked up young, again, no hate, because I do see the both sides of that. Like there's part of me that's like, damn, some people are gonna be done raising children their and get kids to are live be their lives. 15 when our kids are two. Yeah. Like that sucks. But the thing about having kids later, I think, is you get to live the best of both worlds. You get to experience what it would be like to be child free and have financial freedom and not have to worry about, you know, all of the things that come along with taking care of a child and then have a child later in life and then get to experience what it's like to have a child and, and a, not have to struggle. And be a parent and a grandparent. Yeah. You still get all of that, but you also get to do that. So it's not like you get indefinite financial freedom, but you get well, like, a and piece hopefully, of it. And for me, my biggest goal was like not having children until I'm financially like not just stable, but set up free. Like where I do not worry about diapers or let alone putting my kid through college, buying my kid a house. Like I want to be able to set my kid up so that they can be successful and, and kind of like lead that generational wealth. Yeah. If you have kids when you don't have any money, it's still very possible, but it sure as fuck makes it a lot harder. Yeah. Especially like, I know it can be done, but like if you're, I don't know, someone that doesn't already want to be a parent, like that could be even more of a struggle. That's why it's like, I'm so impressed by, I have a couple of friends who had children very young and we're still able to make such an impressive life. And not only that, but also raise really impressive children. Like, kudos to you because like mm -hmm. could not be me if i was raising a kid when i was 21 dude i was trying to raise myself that girl was a nutball you know you think like in a scenario like that maybe it would be a blessing in disguise because you would have no choice sometimes Grow you are up. like forced yeah. to do things when you have no choice you make it happen totally but i think about like everything i was going through during that time period i don't know if i could i know that i would have risen to the occasion but would i have you know there's there's you always would've. a question you would have but it's so good that we had the time to become yeah. who we needed to be yeah. in the time that we had. Because it gave it gives you time to just like experiment with other things in life and you don't just have to settle for the first like career just to provide. You know what I'm saying? Like you get to build the life that you want. Build. Well, I think that's why it's so important to marry a man who wants to be a husband and a father, not just a man who wants a wife and a baby. Because a man who just wants a wife and a baby wants that picture, wants the trophy, wants the credit of look at my beautiful wife and my gorgeous child. The accolades of being the family man. But doesn't act actually want to do what it takes to be a partner, a husband, a father, because it is very, very different to be a husband and a father than to just be a man that had a baby and a wife, which is why I'm glad I didn't choose a man when I was 21. Right. Because at that stage of your life, you're thinking about what you want that's right in front of you, AKA the shitty boyfriend or shitty relationship and like trying to make it work because you want love, you want a family, you want this, you want that, rather than what your life's going to look like down the line, looking at the bigger picture of who's going to be a good husband, a good father, and who's going to actually bring value to your life like years and years from now. Absolutely. And you don't have the emotional maturity at that age to depict that in each person. Yeah, 100%.
moment. So when I think about building a life and having kids and having families and relationships and everything that I wasn't equipped to decide and figure out when I was younger that I feel like I'm more aware of now, I discovered something called the birth order dating theory. So this theory explains what birth orders are supposed to be the most compatible. So for example, firstborn children and last born children are most compatible because firstborn children like to care for others, are organized and usually like to be in control. Whereas last borns are used to being dependent and looked after and it actually makes a good balance in a relationship. Another example that's kind of similar to the firstborn last born situation is an only child and a last born because the only child is used to being independent, in control, yada, yada, yada. Whereas a last born again is used to being a little bit more flexible, like more submissive in a sense, not that they are submissive, but less likely to be the one that takes control of a situation. Another good pairing could be a firstborn or an only child and a middle child because the middle children are more adaptable. They've had to deal with being the adaptable child because they're dealing with parents, older siblings, younger siblings, and they're just usually like the peacekeepers. The floater. Yeah. They usually fit in good with a firstborn because they can like adapt to the firstborn's intensity or like an only child who is again used to being more independent and in control. The most incompatible pairs are only children. A pair of only children because they're used to having their space. They're used to being in control of their own situation. You know, they might have a little bit of only child syndrome. I'm an only child, not talking shit. So it doesn't really balance each other out and it might cause more problems than it does good. And two firstborn children could be a bad pair because they're both used to being in control and it might be hard to like submit to the other. It might cause conflict. And then also last born children because neither of them are used to taking control into a situation and someone has to be the one that calls the shots or like picks the place to eat at the end of the day. Well, and it makes so much sense because there's so much independence or codependence mm. that comes into being an only child, a first child, or a last child. When you're the baby, you're babied. Mm -hmm. When you're an only child, you're the only child. Yeah. When you're a first child, you're the mom. Yeah. So if you're a mom with another mom, it's yeah. gonna clash. If you're a baby with another baby, there's no adult around. And obviously this doesn't go for every single situation because you could be the middle child and have to care for all of your younger siblings. So that could give you more of like the eldest child vibe about you, or you could even be the youngest child caring for your eldest sibling. Like you never know what the situation is. You could also be an only child that cares for your parents or that teaches your parents things or your raises your cousins. Like there are so many variables. This isn't like, take it with a grain of salt. It's not a set in stone thing. It's just one more aspect to consider when dating because I think there are so many variables when you're dating to look out for and yeah. Well, and it's a vibe, right? Like you can be a last born child and have first born child syndrome. syndrome. You could be a child of seven and have only child syndrome. So like regardless of what your actual order is, you know where you fall in the mm -hmm. hierarchy. Like you feel that vibe. If your partner is the last child but has first child syndrome and you're the first child and you have last child syndrome, it's still gonna work in that sense. Yeah, yeah no, it, you could make any, I'm a firm believer that you could make anything work. Like whether it's an avoidant attachment, an anxious attachment relationship or two avoidant relationships or two first children or two only children, I think that you can make anything work. It kind of just, again, that's why I said take it with a grain of salt depends on the person you're dealing with and how much communication and healing and work they've done on themselves and how like communicative and adaptable they're willing to be with you I guess in like a certain scenario I don't really have a good example but I would say like for me I'm an only child and I've had people tell me oh you have only child syndrome which I would actually like to disagree I might have certain things like I remember when Madison and her sister first moved in with me or I moved in with them rather only child and <laughs> I like hated when Madison specifically or like <laughs> my other roommates that weren't Madison's sister would wear my clothes because those were mine. And She's I was like, like touch my shit. I'm like, why the fuck are you in my new shirt? I'd be like out of town. I'd look on Snapchat. There's like them wearing my shirt. I mean, that is kind of out of pocket for I sure. Mean, you could ask. Yeah. We, all, we were all so close. So it shouldn't have mattered because in like their mind, they're all sisters. This is what sisters do. Like, I don't really ask if I'm going to wear my mom's shirt. I just go I, take it. I mean, when, when you're have a sibling, my sister every day, I walk out, she's in something I'm at. You don't yeah. even think about it, yeah. you know? So I would say that is kind of where, yes, I had the only child syndrome. I also really like to be alone. I'm not very social. I get very like overstimulated with too much company. I grew up alone. No hate or shade to my parents. You know, they were like, why do you always hide in your room? Well, because I want to be in my room. But that's a different conversation. But yeah, I feel like growing up with Madison, I outgrew that. And I don't know if that's why I have less. Because of, I forced you to. But I don't know if that's why I have like less of an only child syndrome 
attention to her because like I am an only child and I do see I'll let you speak on it actually you know me the best I was just about to speak on it so I'm glad I'm glad she's gonna <laughs> let me <laughs> Just say good thing. When I first met Allie, obviously we had a friendship from the very beginning. And like we had a very deep friendship that didn't change from her being an only child or not. But there were definitely things about her that I noticed where it was almost like she was the center of her own universe. Not in like a selfish way. Damn. <laughs> But no, but just in like a way where like you weren't used to accommodating a sibling in that way. Like where it was constantly like, we need to do this. I need this. You need this. It was like, you were not accustomed to having somebody else to consider all of the time like that. Mm -hmm. And then I became your sister basically right off the jump. I mean, we started hotel rooms together. Then we started living together. Then we started doing everything together. I mean, mm -hmm. you'd come home. I'd be in your bed. Be like, <laughs> why are you in my Which fucking, I fucking bed? Hate it. <laughs> <laughs> but the only child in me. I was through, like, why are you in my fucking bed? Well, and like for me, my family was like, that's just the way we were. No, it was yeah. it was all up in each other's grill all the time. I understand mm -hmm. there's boundaries. People have boundaries. And I think that's something with Allie that she really transformed to really quite easily for someone who grew up alone was understanding that even though that that is how you are comfortable, that that's not always like way, the way it should be or the way it needs to be. Well, I think the reason, and it was like a bit of a challenge in certain areas because not only was I raised in kind of a we weren't like a very tight-knit affectionate type family like we all kind of kept to ourselves and then me being an only child it made it you know hard to connect and then the issues between us like we just I was just very isolated and I isolated myself they did not isolate me they would have loved to include me but I kind of made that choice and like me being someone that's actually very affectionate and very loving and very sensitive when I you was needed in, more you when wanted I was, more yeah when I was introduced to you and your sister and like that type of life it was a change and it was hard to like as change is to adapt to but it was ultimately not that hard because it's always what I think I want always who you were yeah it was like it was like you were born to have sisters yeah it's where I felt the most safe and happy and loved was once I had you guys enter my life because I felt I didn't feel so alone anymore as much as you guys irritate the shit out of me sometimes <laughs> well, that's how family is though but like, that's what sisters do it's irritating as all hell mm -hmm. especially my family like my dad sometimes I'll wake up and he'll just be like in my living room and mm -hmm. I'm like what dad I am married <laughs> like you can't just like what if my pants are off? yeah I know it's sometimes I pop I like have to look around the corner sometimes but mm -hmm. it's like we just grew up in a family where you that's just what you do and like blood is thick mm -hmm. in my family and my dad always said blood is thicker than water but you it choose is. who's your blood yeah so well you're my blood <laughs> do you feel like growing up as an only child like created trauma for you being alone like through traumatic experiences because i know having someone who went through the same shit that i did was so important to my healing yeah i do i think going through hard shit with your family being a kid is hard because you feel alone the world is against you like we were just talking about like as you grow you change and you evolve and like life gets easier as you get older when you're a kid all you know is your parents and so having no siblings to connect with or to understand definitely made Made all of the things I went through harder and it made me feel like very very isolated and very alone and I have a lot of friends you know we're at an age now where people are having kids and I have a lot of co-workers and stuff that have children and they're they'll ask me like as an only child do you think I'm okay if I don't have any more kids I don't know if I want to have more but I love my son or I love my daughter I just don't know if I want more kids and the one thing I always want to say is specifically only children will understand this but please don't just have one child it is lonely as fuck to not have anyone to relate your trauma to well damn <laughs> but it is it's like they ask me this and i want to say oh yeah well i turned out fine because i did but do you know how many years i spent feeling so alone and again i don't want to put any blame on anybody because it's not like anyone tried to make like i isolated myself but it's like how do you go to your parents for something that they don't understand you want to go to someone that's experiencing the things that you're experiencing or even to just know that there's someone there. Like I just had nobody. Also, my situation could particularly be different. I'm not saying it was like the worst situation in the world, but you know, it's hard to not have anyone to understand your experience or to tell your experience to someone and like they can they can listen but they can't fully understand because they weren't there and all they can hear is what you're telling them and sometimes i think people have a hard time relating or connecting to something that they haven't experienced themselves well and i think that's something we've actually said before is trauma is only perceived in the eye of the beholder mm. you can only experience trauma that you've experienced like i said someone could get their leg cut off and someone could get a paper cut and you're like oh that's yeah it's the same it's the 
same maybe level of trauma for each person. And the person who got their leg cut off is like, fuck you, you have no idea what this yeah. is like. And the person who got like a festering paper cut is like, you don't know what this is like. And that's why having a sibling is so important because it's not someone who you're telling your trauma to or who's trying to be empathetic. You don't have to tell them. It is someone who experienced very similar, if not identical trauma mm -hmm. as you, who maybe they're not the same person as you. Cause like my sister and I are very completely opposite sides of the spectrum as far as human beings and personalities and the way that we handle things. We're very different, but we went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when I look at her at the end of the day and she looks at me and we know where that hurt or that pain comes from, I know that I will always have her and she will always have me. Why is this making me emotional? <laughs> but it's so beautiful because I, it's something that I like, envy is not the right word because there's no like negative feelings towards anyone that has that, but it's something that like I wish I had. And I'm not saying you can't be a very happy, well-functioning only child. I just think it has a lot to do with, you know, whenever anyone asks me, do I have to have another kid? Are they going to be lonely? I'm like, you need to consider who you're married to, who their father is, who their mother is. And like, if you guys are able to give them a happy, healthy, functional, loving life, then I don't necessarily think you have to have another kid. God forbid that baby who is now a grown adult human has to go through a divorce on their own. Parents hating each other on their own. No family on their own. Parents, picking sides on their own. Parents get in a car accident, they're both dead. And I know yeah. that's bleak, but like you cannot judge the future. You don't know what is going to happen. You have one kid, you and your husband good point. both die in a car accident. Your parents are both- Your kid's just what, alone? Completely alone. And like, you can't just assume that your child is going to be at a place when something horrible like that happens. That Where they could take care of themselves. God forbid they're a, a kid still and you don't have an aunt or an uncle or grandma or a grandpa. And then your child goes into the system alone. Like, I've actually never even thought of it like that. Worst That's... case scenario, right? But this shit happens. No, but it's true. I just think there's, here's the thing. I've Oops, talked sorry. about this before on previous podcasts that I, I don't know if I want children and it has nothing you know we got a lot of uh, people agreeing with me that like if you don't think you want them then I think you shouldn't have them because it's not fair to the kid but we also got a lot of hate on that reel because for some reason people think that women just exist to have children that's it that's what we're here for but here's the thing like children aren't just babies forever they grow into full grown adults and human beings shoot up schools, become serial killers, like animal abusers, like do horrible, horrible things. And we, you know, there's always the question of nature versus nurture, but at the end of the day, it's like, if you are able to provide your child with the best upbringing and you never know, cause you never know genetically what your child is gonna be given. But if your child is given the best shots right out of the gate with two parents that love them, siblings that could care for them, a family support system, the literally support, yes. anything just to help them get through, get by in life, which is already hard as it is, even if everything is perfect, then you're setting your child up for the best result. They stand a better chance. Yeah. And can I just say, I don't know how many times a podcast, you steal the fucking words out of my head. <laughs> like I'm literally thinking something that I'm prepared to say, and then you say it. That's good. And I'm like, shit, I gotta prepare something else. Shit, now I gotta think of something else to say. <laughs> and then you say it, and I'm like, bitch, quit stealing my line. Cause we're locked <laughs> in, baby. She really steals my line. It's like we literally talked about it. We didn't, we didn't talk about it. It was literally my line. No, I literally <laughs> told you what I was gonna talk about. No, but just like when you, you, yeah. you verbatim. And this is where it comes down to choosing a partner that is going to be the best, not only for you, but also for your children. Because hurt people hurt people and healed people heal people. Because a lot of the times as traumatized hurt people, we uh, tend to attract people who are also hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's just a cycle of hurting and hurting and hurting. And it's possible to heal together when you both come from a hurt place, but it's a hell of a lot harder. Yeah. When you meet someone who is healed and has truly dealt with their trauma or is dealing with their trauma. It makes you want to be healed. It heals you. That's, that's healing in itself is mm -hmm. watching someone care enough about themselves to heal and care enough about you to want you to heal. Yeah, because like when you're hurt and you're the quote unquote toxic one in a relationship, that is no fault to your own. I, I truly genuinely believe that people are good at heart and that we are just a product of our environment and of our experiences. And it's really hard to heal unless you do like extensive therapy and are really, really self-aware. But when you meet somebody, and of course this takes a tremendous amount of patience for the other person taking on this task or this, you know, burden in, in a sense to be the person that like enlightens somebody to heal but I've experienced this you've experienced this I hope that I've been healing to some people and seeing how love and care and 
life should be considered through the lens of somebody else is so eye-opening, especially when you're stuck in this like traumatic cycle or this version of yourself that you're not happy with. Seeing somebody maybe not call you out, but kind of like bring light to your toxic traits and you seeing them be healed and healthy and them being willing to work with you and still love you through the pain and the trauma that you've been through because they see the true you. Like you've talked about this with your partner, like he saw you for you. Right. And I always told you because I also saw you for you because the you that was you was always there. It's just certain parts of us get brought to light, especially in relationships, if that's where we feel the most traumatized, like in scenarios where love is involved because, and it's so silly to think that our childhood could affect how we choose our partners in the future, how we treat our partners or past relationships makes more sense, but it really does have such an effect, like a grave effect that is so hard to pull yourself out of until you either A, do the work on your own or meet somebody that like helps you heal. And it's somebody that's doing the work because the truest fact about somebody who's hurt and not wanting to heal is they're gonna bring you down with them. Yeah. Like, have you ever met somebody who's so hurt and so fucked up? And you're hurt and you're fucked up too, right? But you want to heal, but their aura, their energy, their vibe, their the, their existence is so negative that it just sucks you into the vortex. Or like even you being the one that's not healed and still hurting, seeing them, wanting to heal them, but you're, you cannot because that's not what they want. And then you are both being dragged to the ground because it's like, you're so focused on helping them, but they're not wanting to help themselves. Which is why I'm a true believer of a hurt party and a healed party are gonna do a hell of a lot better than two hurt parties. Because yeah. someone who is healing or in the process of healing and wants to heal, their energy is gonna be something that actually lifts you up. And this isn't to say that if you're healing that you should like want to be with someone that is hurt or traumatized or hasn't done the healing yet, because that could also be a recipe for disaster. You can't disaster. be a fixer, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can't be somebody that wants to fix everyone because that's me. I could be in the worst mental state of my life and meet somebody that I care for and see the light in because like as humans, as good humans, I think we all see the good in people and then want to try to fix them when there is no fixing to be had. The only scenario in which this concept makes sense is if you've been hurt, you've healed from it, you meet someone that has also been hurt is also trying to actively heal from it. Like somebody that is aware of the healing that needs to be done. You can't be with somebody and expect it to work if they are traumatized and hurt and fucked up. And, and they victim. have no idea. Yeah. Living in a victim mindset or or just flat out like don't want to heal, don't see the problem with the way that they're living. Well, that's the difference between being someone who's hurt and is healing or healed and wanting to be with someone who's also wanting to heal. Yeah. And being with someone who has been through trauma and is in a fucked up place and sees other people who are in a fucked up place and mm -hmm. is like, I'm going to make them been there. better. Yeah. You can't make somebody better if you're not there yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you're there yourself, you're not gonna be attracted to people who, who don't want that. Yeah. I'm not saying that you're not gonna be attracted to people who haven't been through things, but you're not gonna be attracted to people who are stuck in that are victim happy mindset. happy living in, yeah. And I actually saw something once, and you know, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this or not, but it definitely stuck with me. You cannot bring a man to your level. A man will always bring you to his level. So if his life is a mess, your life will be a mess too. And I think that this kind of thought came into play where it's like women are natural healers, naturally more empathetic, naturally more understanding. So if a very angry, strong, dominant man comes into your life and you think that you can fix him, you can't. You can't fix somebody. I would say even on the contrary, like a man that's not super dominant or powerful, but almost gives off that like, help me type Type of energy where you feel like as a woman like you see this little boy in him in like not a weird way but you want to help him because you feel like you can if a man is that traumatized he's gonna stay that way and he's just looking for someone to fill the void in the meantime but he's not actually looking to heal to heal and the reason i said that maybe i don't agree with this is because i do believe that as women we are powerful enough to bring people to our level like a strong independent confident happy woman can bring a broken man to her level, but it takes a very specific type of man and a very specific type of woman 
to change somebody's mindset like that, where it's like, if you're a woman who is partially broken and partially just looking for validation and love and, you know, that own kind of reciprocation and you find a man who, I mean, <sighs> love bombs you and makes you feel like he's all of those things, but really, you know, deep down he's broken and he's not there. You can't save him. You can't fix him. So let me ask you a question. What do you think are the signs of a man that is ready for either the healing process or a healthy relationship or to start the journey into a healthy life slash relationship. This is a tale as old as time and it's so fucking corny, but if you actually dig deep into it, it's so true. It's like the four yeses of a man and it's patient, kind, balanced, and fine. So a man- <laughs> Fine. Fine, not like fine, but like he's fine. Yeah. Patience in a man is an absolute must mm -hmm. because as women- We're emotional. We finna try that patience. <laughs> We gon' we finna test the patience. Kind. We finna be in the pit. We're gonna be we're gonna be testing that patience. And yeah. if a man can't be patient with you and patient with himself and patient with his job, the last thing you want is an emotionally explosive. Because if somebody is being explosive, they have like a deeper rooted issue. Exactly. Especially as a man. For a man to be kind is it's not a man's first instinct. No, because it's like a woman thing to be like the nurturing, kind. caring, kind. If a man can be kind, everything you just said it put a smile on my face honestly because it's like but like how corny is it no but it's it's so true because every single thing you listed i don't you're gonna have to explain the fine, fine part because <laughs> i'm thinking fine i'm like oh my man's got check 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 check, check. <laughs> but it's true because patience like i am i lack patience but it's because i'm heightenedly emotion and i care and i'm passionate it doesn't come from like where i feel like with men if you lack patience you kind of lack like self-awareness and self-control yeah or like emotional intelligence in certain situations the like the test of a man is his self-control well because my lack of patience doesn't come from lack of self-control it comes from like a real place whereas with men i feel like if i'm losing my patience with a man it's because they're not understanding where i'm coming from and if but if they're being does that i don't feel like i'm rambling now but no it makes sense the test of a man is a man who has self-control because if a man doesn't have self-control he can't control your relationship his career his eyes, his hands, your partnership, everything will fall apart if a man doesn't have self-control. And that's where it really comes into, does he have patience? Is he kind? Is he balanced? Is he fine? <laughs> Is because all of that comes back around to can a man do things that are hard yeah and things that he doesn't want to do for the greater good of his family his relationship himself and the funny thing when you say the word hard i immediately think of like the emotional things because that's the hardest of it all and give women a little credit here because we deal with emotions more so than men just like genetically and how we are generationally built. We deal with the emotions. We pick up the emotions of men, of our family, of our parents, of our siblings, of our friends. Whereas men don't have that same problem because they're busy providing blah, 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 blah. And in today's day and age, women are doing all the same shit that men are doing. So if a man has patience and control of himself, that is so incredibly hard. Coming from a woman, women have to deal with this shit on a daily basis. And it is one of the hardest things to control is your emotions. It takes so much mental strength, strength and control, self-control and understanding and empathy towards other people and truly well versing yourself in the knowledge of humans and what makes them tick and just putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else to truly be, I feel like the best word for this is like empathetic. Absolutely. And the men that can't do that are usually the most macho men of them all. And it's like, how macho are you if you can't do one of the hardest things that exists? Which is emotion. Yeah. Because men get so pent up believing that emotion is a negative thing. Or like a sissy bitch woman shit. But that's thing. where I come back to fine. Yeah. Because if a man is fine, I mean, obviously he's fine. <laughs> but when I say he's fine, I mean like he is, in control. He is fine with feeling emotions. He is fine with trauma. He's fine with bad things happening. He's fine with you acting out. He's fine with maybe financial issues or whatever it may be. He's not going to freak out and let it spiral him into oblivion. And that's exactly it. When you think of somebody that's fine, like, okay, she's fine. Obviously, when, when it comes to a chick, it's like, <laughs> no, but like, I'm fine. But like, you're not actually yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah. If a man is says, I'm fine. He's fine. They're fine. If a man can be fine with all of the fucked up shit that's happening in his life, 
and still be able to be emotionally competent. Also patient, balanced, and kind. I mean, that's somebody that's worth fighting for. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that person's gonna be perfect because everybody has problems. Even my fiance who is patient, fine, balanced, and kind. How many times am I gonna fucking say that? <laughs> say that 10 times fast. Patient, fine, balanced, kind. Patient, fine, balanced, kind. <laughs> Wait, you kind of killed it. I know, thank you. <laughs> yeah. He has his moments, mm -hmm. but I know who he is. He's human. I know who he wants to be. Mm -hmm. And I know who he will always be. I know he will never betray me mm. by being impatient, mean, unbalanced, or not fine. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he's small. And that's why I picked him. Mm -hmm. Because I've been with a lot of men that maybe had three. Maybe they had two. But it's not but enough. Not four, yeah. It's not enough. Yeah. So before we end the pod, I heard a quote recently that I really, really liked. And it said... If you pray for flowers, don't be surprised if it rains. And I feel like it's just so true because it's like, you can't appreciate the good unless you've had the bad. You can't recognize love unless you've felt pain. And you sure as shit won't know success unless you've been through struggle. And I just think it's a good reminder for anybody, like if you're going through something or a difficult time, or you feel like you're not gonna see the sun on the other side of the horizon, like another quote that I love is, there's always rainbows after rain. Because literally, when do you see it rain? And there's no rainbow. There's always a rainbow. And that's like such a true testament to you can't enjoy things unless you've been through bad things. Imagine if everything was just given to us on a silver platter. Because as cliche as it sounds, it's like if you haven't felt the struggle, felt the pain, felt the heartache of life, how are you going to appreciate it when it changes? How would you even know that it's good? It's like, actually, have you seen the movie The Giver? No. Oh my God, such a good movie. It's basically about like everyone. If you haven't seen this movie, go watch it. It's called The Giver. Life is basically like the government makes everything in black and white and you can't feel emotions. And then someone kind of breaks through and starts to see things and see color and feels their first emotion. But they did it so that everyone was on the same playing field. But it was such a bleak existence. And basically when this person discovered feelings, emotions, love, sadness, color, like life, what life is all about. People were like, why would you want to feel that? And it was like, because there is nothing to life without it. And it's such a beautiful story, but it's there's such a powerful message behind that because again, as cliche as it sounds, sometimes I even think about my own life and the things that I've been through and the struggles and the pain and the heartache. Like for example, you, how would you know how amazing the love that you have now is had you not been through the worst of the, the worst. worst? Yeah. And to really feel the satisfaction of any win, you have to know what it feels like to feel the devastation of a loss. Yeah. And that is the so, so true. If you're going through a hard time, a bad time, a time where you feel like you cannot get through and there's no tomorrow, just remember that there is no sunshine without gray skies, corny, but on a real fucking note, the goodest of the good, the best things you'll ever experience, the richest you could ever be, you wouldn't appreciate without being poor and sad and broken. Yeah. Because if you were born into it born into this life with everything handed to you sure life would be easier but you would have different problems but to truly be able to experience life from like a gratitude like a gracious perspective i think makes life feel more wholesome and worth it life is not worth anything without the struggle of your dick a huge dick in your ass <laughs> <laughs> i'm leaving that <laughs> I was so wondering where you're going. Life isn't worth it without struggle. Yeah. And that's why we're here. Because we're here to just experience things with you guys and to just talk about things with you guys and just like celebrate and my to birthday. And things with you guys. Oh yeah, you guys missed it. But it's, midnight uh, came and midnight went. Cheers. Happy birthday, Madison. Thank without you. you, there would be no bad therapy. Without you, there would be no me. <laughs> and I'm just so fucking lucky to have you in my life and as my best friend. And like, I just hope the best of the best for you forever and ever. And I can't wait to spend the rest of your birthdays with you. We were talking before we started filming again. We became really, really, really tight when we were like 18 and 19. Four. And now we're <laughs> 26 and 27. And it's like, Holy shit. It's been almost a decade of trials, tribulations, losses, learning, <sighs> successes, defeats. It has been. There's something about like the age that we're approaching that makes me a little emotional thinking about where we came from because it feels like yesterday. But when I actually think about it, it's been so long. And there's like such a golden sunrise over the horizon coming for us. Yeah. There's so much more to come. It's like when I was 22, I thought, oh, this is it. When I turned 25, oh, this is it. Life's just getting started. Cheers to episode 35. 
episode 27. <laughs> we'll see you next week, next year, next life, bitches. We love you, baddies. Next week, next year, next, next life. life. <laughs> How cute. Aww.